Are you secure? Yeah, we're secure. I'm Susan Northrup. I'm married to skipper John Heil. This is Matt's bat. Um, she is a 1943 Boeing Stearman that is actually named after our youngest child. So if you've seen any pictures of our other airplane, which is a Harvard Mark IV named Jay's Bird, when child number two came along, three and a half later, years later, when he got old enough to start noticing things like names of airplanes. He looked at us one day and said, so so where's my airplane? And we looked at it for a long time when we decided that when it was named it would be Matt's Bat. But I had this little thing about my boys getting their Eagle Scout awards. So I would not let this new project for a second airplane start until after the Eagle Scout was completed and he got his project done and then they found this in pieces and parts on eBay. eBay. About 20 grand as I recall. It had four out of five wing sections and mostly a data plate. John Skipper Heil, Susan told you how it got to be named Matt's Bat. We did find it on eBay. Uh, $20,000 for a project. Uh, I was not going to buy it sight unseen so I told him I'd give him some earnest money and come down and look at it. it. Took me about two weeks to get down to Boynton Beach, Florida, uh, just south of Fort Lauderdale. Looked at it, it was enough. Uh, so we consummated the purchase. Both of my boys, the Jay's Bird and the Matt's Bat one, wanted to get their AMPs and I wanted a Stearman. So it all worked out. Uh, I, as the A and P can supervise their work. They did a lot of it, and uh, it took us just shy of four years uh, to get this all together. She's legal, she's fine, she's got about seven hours on her. Still getting the ring seated, and uh, eventually she'll go on my, my aerobatic competency card, uh, and I'll be doing shows in the T6 and in this. Uh, and taking her wherever I can at 90 miles an hour in a steerman. Is this always a dream project of yours? Uh, I know you like the steerman, you have a special... If well, the steerman, I used to, my first job at 17 was putting up hot air balloons in Hanover County, Virginia, at a place called Barnstormers Air Shows. We had two steermans, hot air balloon, three skydivers. Uh, Scott Seiler uh, was uh, ex-Navy uh, enlisted. Lynn Bottoms was a Navy instructor pilot in Stearman's during World War II and Park Smith flew Spitfires in the Battle of Britain. And those were the guys that I saw flying these things and that was the first one, uh, first time. So I've been around Stearman's a long time. I flew a 450 Stearman on the side when I was instructing uh, in the Air Force, at, uh, Reese Air Force Base in Lubbock, Texas. Uh, and I, uh, I've actually run into one of those old airplanes, 79 Mike, that's owned up in Pennsylvania, who's being restored right now. And Stearman's just a neat airplane, so ended up with the Stearman. Do you know the history of this Stearman before you purchased it? 
Well, uh, through research, and you can see up there how we got it marked for rank and field, that is her serial number in the war on this build number from Boeing. So Tex Rankin <coughs> was a um, <coughs> world aerobatic champion type. Uh, he was one of the guys that Hap Arnold went to uh, before World War II formally started for us. And, you know, I can't train enough pilots. We don't have the infrastructure, so Spartan School Aeronautics, Rankin uh, Aeronautical Academy, uh, Embry-Riddle, a couple of those places. And he set this up in Tulare Field, California. This airplane was there. She showed up in July of 43. This is her paint job, with the exception of the buzz number. Because I cannot find any records, even having gone over to Maxwell uh, in Alabama, to look of what this serial number, and that's hers, would have had painted on the side. There's about three color photos of that era of rank and field of these airplanes. Uh, and I, I, this is the paint job up to including the chevron on the top wing, which is, in, all this is in violation of tech order. Tech order would have just had them silver, but uh, there's a perpetual haze in the San Joaquin, so Tex put the, the fuselage stripe and the chevron for safety, more visibility. And uh, 565 is my, was my F-16, so I decided to go with that. And that's why she got 565 on the back, on the side. So the service history-wise, we don't know because of the serial numbers. Well, no, we, we it stayed at Rankin Field through until uh, 47 when it was sanctioned out in the Air Force okay. National Security Act. It became the U.S. Air Force. And at that point, she was given to the Philippine Air Force to reconstitute herself. Uh, I'm not, their records are kind of sketchy and it's hard to get to the PI from here. So sometime in there, they got rid of it, sold it to a Filipino civilian who flew it for a while and in 1995, by that time, she was taken apart, sent back to the States, went through three or four owners in the States, and I'm the last one. But everything here, uh, you know, that this is 75565, 561 is, is my, uh, 5651, sorry, hard to talk this morning. <laughs> but that's the Boeing build number that relates to that serial number in the Air Corps. The only thing that's not authentic on here is the buzz number. And for the dope codes, we made her birthday July 4th. I'm sure the odds of that were pretty slim, but it was sometime in July 43 when she showed up. So we're close. No, it, no engine came with the project. So uh, you can't do this without uh, a community. Uh, Jim Radliff, uh, about 45 minutes east of here, had a couple, including a Continental Ordnance Engine, which was used in the M3 light tank. Some of the parts are interchangeable. Uh, he sold me both of those. We took them all apart. That was part of the boys' engine experience. Sent them, I drove them with Matthew all the way out to Guthrie, Oklahoma. I said, here's everything I got. Make me a 6N and give me two spare cylinders. And that's what Caleb did out there. That's what we've got on it. So this is a 670-6N, zero time overhaul. Uh, and we mounted her, uh, I went with the inertial and electric start, uh, so it can be cranked. We did put the, the primer out here. If I had to do over again, I'd think about putting a second primer in the cockpit so I could just do it all from there. But it can be started from right here. That works. We do have a crank, and we can we can do it the old-fashioned way from the. If anybody's seen the Robert Taylor, How to Fly the Yellow Pearl, Navy training tapes. Uh, this prop, I didn't want to go with a Macaulay because the the idea that AD bothered me. And when you put on a wooden prop, while it's very smooth, it's also like swinging a baseball bat. I wanted to do acro in it, so I wanted a little bit more power. This is actually the, the AGCAT prop, uh, square tips. Everybody will be all panicky, but you can't have that on a steerman. But if you look at the type data certificate for that propeller, it's 96 inches long, and it will go on a 6N with no restrictions. After five weeks of waiting for the FAA to come out with some questions that they had to ask me, my two engineer two student, uh, children found that. We sent that in, and two hours later, my 
my Fed that was helping me out called me and said, yeah, go fly to the airplane, no restrictions, you're good. So, glad that my two boys know them more than the whole engineering section of the FAA. And uh, there's already dozens of these airplanes out flying with this, but in the old days you could do a field approval. Uh, apparently, uh, maintenance inspectors aren't allowed to do field approvals anymore for some reason. So, anyway, we overcame the adversity. She's, uh, but that, that five weeks of sitting around, that was a lot of good flying weather here in Georgia when it was nice and warm. Sure. And uh, that kind of cut down. That's why she's only got about seven and a half hours on her. What kind of performance does she have? Uh, I, you know, it's a Stearman. It's a great airplane as long as you don't have to go anywhere. <laughs> uh, it's great for chasing deer through cornfields at sundown and that kind of stuff. I get about 90 miles an hour uh, at 1850 in cruise so far. Uh, I haven't flown her enough. I, I've been, uh, after the, the very short engine break-in period that Caleb recommends for his engines, uh, we have been just going up and trying to get time and seat the rings. At some point I will start making specific cross country so I can have a good measurement of fuel consumption and uh, you know my oil consumption is still way too high with the with the rings not being seated. So that's not worth really looking at because I know it'll get better and it is getting better. You can already tell. Uh, you asked earlier about, uh, you know, uh, who, where things were done and who did what and stuff. But my, my boys pretty much did it all. Uh, I, I, I'm an AMT. I, they did it under my supervision. Uh, my IA also helped. Jay here uh, is a welder. Matthew did some owner uh, made parts on the lathe and uh, uh, milling machines for stuff that we just could not find. And I've been a T6 guy for 21 years and this is my first dive into the Stearman community. So guys like Mike Porter, Jim Radliff, uh, if you shop well, you can do pretty good on eBay as long as you know what you're looking for. I found a guy in Prescott City, Arizona that had bought an old hanger for the car that was in it and had no idea what the Stearman parts were. So I get my physical out there. I told him, well, look, I'll bring my parts manual. I'll drive out there and, you know, do, I'll do this and we'll decide what you're going to give me for it. And uh, I got a bunch of fittings and, and dog bones and stuff from him. The canopy, or not the canopy, sorry. The, the I did have the frames. I had the panels. I found the uh, shock mounts on eBay. Again, you have to know what you're looking for. The instrumentation was all rebuilt uh, uh, by a shop up in Pennsylvania because I don't have that capability. This is based on a stock Stearman, one of many stock Stearmans. There are lots of choices out there. This is the one that I picked. Uh, the T limitations is up there because it is part of my airworthiness certification. Uh, as an aside here, this airplane never had an airworthiness certificate until I got one in June of this year. Uh, the reason was that she was never civilly registered aircraft. Uh, so I had a DAR come out and she actually brought her fed with her. And they went through the airplane and they issued it. And then there was that cost issue I told you about. We got that all squared away. So we are now back to standard category airworthiness or aerobatic uh, standard air, standard aerobatic category is what the airplane is per note 7 of the type data certificate for Stearman's. We had wooden seats that were coming apart like metal because you can step on metal and not worry about going through it. Uh, the electrical system is pretty much homemade. Original Stearman's didn't have an electrical system. There was no battery. You started it with that crank up there and that was all you needed. Bow support from the instructor to yell at the student and no other communication was necessary. So I, I did have an electrical guy put help me put that together. The boys were his uh, worker bees so that they could learn about electricity. We do have an alternator on it because I wanted an alternator. I, I've got the alternator STC for T6s and I, that's just so much better than the, the old carbon pile generators with the weight and the smoothness of the electricity. So we went with that. Everything else though is, is stock. Uh, the way one particular method of Stearman's doing it. Different 
uh, militaries put stuff in different places. Compass would be over the turning bank, turning bank would be down, you know, stuff on the other side. It, it's what you want it to be. Uh, and that's the way we went back with it. The radios, of course, which were not in a, ever in a normal Sturman, uh, got mounted down there because you need them. You know, ADSBs on a tail cone because it has to be there. Thanks to the, you know, Perta making sure that Big Brother can track us all.